Devin Booker finally did it, and he owns the New Orleans Pelicans. On today's episode of Locked On Suns, how Phoenix got a big road win in the Big Easy, and much more. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at Suns. Stop saying that. Writer at Dime Magazine. Those are the Just Basketball Show wherever you get your podcasts. And I also create written and video content over on the Locked On Suns Insiders, which you can sign up for at the link in the show description below. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen. Monday night post game after a big Suns win, 124 to 111. Thank you for finding us wherever you listen to or watch podcasts. We are free everywhere, including YouTube. So just hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're finding the show. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you've just never done it before. Either way, that is the best way to support us. That's also the best way to get great content in your feed every single Monday through Friday. Become an everydayer here with the show. And my commitment back to you is you'll never miss a thing about the Suns. Get locked onto the team all season long right here. Not just all season long. We go through July. I won't do a week where I don't do an episode every day until like August. So that is my commitment really more so than even just the rest of the season because we don't know how long that's going to go. Joining us today, as he does every single week, is Brandon Duenas. He is a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun. And we have a W to talk about, Brandon, which is the best kind of show to do. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. We'll talk about them more later on but i will pass the baton over to you brandon to get us kicked off what is your moment of the game from this 124 to 111 just start to finish handling of the new orleans pelicans yeah well well, first of all it's just a lot better to do this this show after a win i feel like i've gotten a little lucky here these last uh, few episodes with uh coming on at the right time so i'll take that for sure uh just a roller coaster of the season but this game i think uh, obviously everyone's going to point to that first quarter and just Devin Booker exploding, but my my moment of the game is actually how they close it out. I thought uh, those last two drives that he had to get his 50th and, and 52nd uh, points to really close out the game. To me, that was just kind of the, the maturity of, of Book being very patient in the second half. They weren't go, like running everything through him, and I thought there's a lot more balanced attack there in the second half, and, and he took over again when he needed to. So to me, putting those final – touches on the game that's just what superstars do and and he showed up and was awesome throughout the night so uh that's that's good that's mine i'm sure yours is probably gonna be a little different but uh when it happened the other way it's not from the first quarter either It, it is but it is another one from book which is early third quarter when he hits his seven three and then shortly thereafter hits his eight three it just i mean we have we can't we can't do so much of waiting and not address it. So mm-hmm. um, not only did he get to seven, which we know he's obviously done in the postseason, but he does one better and gets gets all the way to eight. And we'll get to it, I think, a little bit maybe to close out the show. I, I don't know. Uh, have some box score stuff to hit on, but I'll just say it here too. I think the fact that he was able to set the tone, him and KD both early, by taking threes – it might not be comfortable. It might be old news. People might be tired of hearing about it or talking about it or ripping their hair out about it, but it matters when this team emphasizes that. And for those two guys to get 27 of them up, it mattered for more than just all of us being able to finally see Book do this random thing. It was actually, I think, a big part of why they won. Yeah, for sure. And I think they're going to have to be able to adapt uh their games, especially come playoff times, there's gonna be different defenses. There's gonna be different looks they're gonna get. So I think uh, if those two can establish that early, it really does open up. And, and Beal too, it really does open up the rest of the, the offense. And, and you could just see that kind of trickle down to the to the rest of the team. And, and like I said, we've seen in the past where Booker's gotten hot, and it seems like they kind of force feed him a little bit, and that's that becomes what the game is. And then they end up blowing a lead. And it looks like it could have gone down that path again tonight, but then. I thought they did a great job of making sure everyone else got involved and, and, you know, Durant had a 
pretty solid night quietly. Same with Nurkic. Uh, Beal was doing some little things and still contributing, even though he didn't really need to score. So I thought um, just picking their moments and, and setting the tone from the start. And and like you said, to start the show, just Booker just owns the Pelicans at this point. He has 162 points in his last three games against them. Uh, I saw the Pelicans, uh, and Antonio Daniels, I believe, pregame was – his key to the game is to stop Devin Booker, and he's gone on a, uh, this funny little rant, and and uh, surely enough, drops fifty two. And uh, but yeah, overall, it was just it was an awesome game from from start to finish. Obviously, you know the Pelicans, you know their DNA, like it's just in them to to fight back and, and cut the lead down, and they did. Yeah, the Suns all they were going to make a run. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my question though. So um, first of all, shout out the Pelicans broadcast. All due respect, love K Ray, love. Eddie Johnson. This is not uh, about them. It is more so about the Pelicans. Best local broadcast in the in the NBA, in my opinion. But I didn't watch it on theirs. I watched EJ and K Ray. So you know, I know I, I know where my bread is buttered. But it is still a fact. Those guys are awesome, and they know their team. And they knew this guy was going to come and eat this team's lunch, which he did. And by this guy, I mean Book. But the question I have is, why do you think that's the case? I wrote about it a little bit on the Insiders recap takeaways that I, I do just kind of bullet points of, of what mattered in the game and what I took away from it and, and all that. And I, I don't think Herb Jones is quite like the level of physical strong defender, whereas like a Lou Dort might be, but that's, that can't explain all of this. I mean, EJ was kind of saying, speaking of the broadcast, like there's just some teams you feel comfortable against some gyms you feel good in. Maybe it's that. And it just, there's not, not really a reason to it. What do you think? Yeah, I think it, that's part of it for sure. I think there's just certain environments or gyms that just you just feel better in the lighting, the court, the ball. Like, there's a lot of things. Just just going back to maybe to like smoothies too, and that too. And then and here's the other part is like his his connection to uh, you know his hometown's like I think post game you say like an hour and a half, hour forty five from there, and he had like a ton of family there and friends there. Um, and I think just ha- having that added motivation and fuel of, you know, like who knows how many people he had there, but I think he said there's at least yeah. like 50 to a hundred uh, folks there just to watch him play. I think that could also add to, to the fire. So I think uh, he definitely loves that arena. He loves playing against that team. He's not just there too. Like he's done it in Phoenix. We saw yeah. that, that massive first half he had uh, with the, the baby fist bump and all that before he got hurt. The so baby who Phoenix, cursed the sons. Yeah. Yes. Um, ban the baby, but uh <laughs> On another note, yeah, I think it's just kind of more uh, a combination of he feels good in that gym. He has all, like a lot of people there supporting him, so it, he just feels good against that team. And like you said, Herb's not someone that's going to really disrupt you and get you off your spot. And I think those are usually the types of defenders that bother Book the most. Uh, he's more of like a team defender, more of a deflector, more of a chaos creator in that sense, rather than just that point of attack, like going to take you out of your your rhythm. So I think that that could be another – small piece of that as well yeah yeah it's 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 not a team where you would look at the roster and say devin booker will carve them up you know because they're a decently good defensive team i think they're 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 big too they're pretty big they're big i mean that's they have lots of wings he struggles for us yeah 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 i think really to me it's maybe another part of it that speaks to kind of go full circle here to your moment of the game they don't really have that back line of defense, right? They they go kind of out of their way. Herb at the point of attack, some of the aggressive help that they have, the length that they can use to do that. And then obviously when Nance is on the court, they play a little differently. They can, you know, blitz and get the ball out of the, the star's hands. And they're, they're well coached. They execute. They're an effective defense. But it's like if you can not be affected by Herb, Dyson Daniels is probably a little too young for, you know, really being a stopper at that level, has 3,025 minutes tonight, and you're getting downhill or you're kind of just really in a rhythm getting to your spots, then that help defense is probably not going to do much to affect you. That that That's like yeah. the best I can do. But again, it's like, okay, that, that might explain some of it. That doesn't explain 160 points in three games, but... Yeah. And especially when that help defense is coming after books hit a few, like he doesn't even see that. Like that's when, yeah. once he gets in that rhythm, he's just locked. So locked in that that's just a secondary back thought in his mind. That, that just, three in the second about. quarter, the one where we know it, right. If we've watched the Suns, where 
the shot clock's running out and he tries to get his his balance he's also hit a few like that to win games the Knicks game winner the the Mavs game winner a couple of years ago off the inbound some moments like mm-hmm. that but when that one just hit the back of the rim and barely even touched the net I was like all right you know we're he already had scored like 30 points at that point but that was the one where I was like all right like something else is happening tonight that's what I wanted it's to pick effortless. For, for my moment um I was between that and the the breaking the threes. So, I mean, there, there's a lot and it was all book related. So good stuff. All right. So I decided our takeaway from this one myself, Brandon and I are not going to go back and forth because I think it's really worth dissecting, which is we can complain about three separate straight weekends of losses to teams without their best players. But at the same time, they are having these high highs. They didn't just beat the Pelicans. They kind of dominated the Pelicans, and that's a team ahead of them in the standing. So we'll try to understand what goes right in these moments that allows the Suns to get these big wins and maybe contrast that a little bit with the Ugly Knights and try to come to an answer of what is going on with this team. We'll do that next. First, today's show brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is doing their part to bring therapy straight to you, make it easier, more accessible, and more useful. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest, big or small. Certain things can really get to you. It's important to let them out, especially, and this is the key in my opinion, to someone who's unbiased about your life, right? Not a family member, not a friend who might actually be involved in the situation, but somebody external, somebody separate that can just hear you, talk to you, and of course, a professional that knows how to handle it. So today, let's talk about something that I feel really strongly about. Where should we go? Um, I like the play-in. I know that's kind of a positive, but it's going to be a thing I probably won't say again on here very much as the Suns maybe have to fight through it and people are feeling like, you know, a little bit of anxiety here, but I think it's awesome. I'm going to enjoy it no matter what. And I think uh, the NBA made a really good decision. And even though the Suns might struggle through it, I am going to maintain that. Obviously, many more important things on all of our minds than our favorite sports teams and therapy can be different for everybody, but it's important to get things like that off your chest every once in a while even if they feel uncomfortable. And if you're thinking of starting therapy today, soon, anytime in the near future, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. All right, Brandon. So the takeaway from tonight is the Suns have high highs just like they have low lows. And tonight was one of those. What do you feel like it, it might have been a big part of this game? Maybe it was somewhat of a small part of this game, but you connected to some past wins like this, beating Denver twice, beating, I mean, they beat the Bucks once upon a time with Giannis. They've had a, a win against the Mavs, a big one on the road. What do you feel like is the ingredient that all of those wins have in common is there one so i'll preface this with i've watched a lot of phoenix suns basketball over the years i've seen a lot of different teams highs and lows this is by far the most confusing team i've ever watched um but what i will say is that there seems to be some consistency with a every time you feel like you're about to give up on them they pull off a performance like this b what leads to that it's usually taking care of the basketball, valuing, valuing the ball. That's, that, that's usually number one. And if it's not that is they've had, they have had some wins where they have turned the ball over. And despite yeah. that, it, it really just comes down to the, the activity on the defensive end and, and on the boards. So I think if they're locked in and engaged, that's kind of uh, checks both boxes. Most of the time, obviously there's going to be teams that force you to turn the ball over. Uh, you can't really control that. Some nights where there's, uh, I think it's the careless turnovers that really, that you can control. And I think when they limit those and also do a good job on the glass and, and play hard defensively, like you're going to have some nights where you, you can't hold someone down to like, you know, less than 110 points just because they're, they're on fire hitting every, you know, every wide open shot or even contested shots. Like that's just how defense goes sometimes. So I think it really yeah. just comes in, down to being locked in. And, and uh, to, to me, like just that Denver game too, and, and this game and the first Spurs game, like, it's just been alternating how intense they were, how focused they were, and 
Uh, yeah. Those are usually the two things that stand out to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I like the way you put it with the turnovers because they have had games where they've exhibited some of the bad things, but still won, and sometimes still won in dominant fashion. So I think that's again, kind of why I wanted to hit on it. And there's been games where they've lost with maybe fewer turnovers or, you know, they've lost when they have good offensive balance. And so, you know, so it's not always the same thing. I'm glad you also said what everybody listening to this is probably, you know, screaming into their phone or, or computer or whatever is effort. Of course, that's the bottom line. But I guess the question is, how does that show up? What are the indicators of, okay, now, like, as I'm watching sitting here, okay, now I know they're playing with effort. I know they brought it. Uh, yeah, maybe some of it is embarrassment and trolling all of us. I, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't put that past them at this point. That feels like as valid of an explanation as anything else you could come up with. But where I come down on it is something that I feel like they actually have in common with the statistically best team in the NBA, which is the Boston Celtics, which is I really feel like they're a rhythm team. And I, I think that they are a team offensively, if they're moving the ball, playing, you know, deliberately trying to kind of generate that rhythm, you know, the ball finds energy that, that hasn't changed since uh, Mike D'Antoni said it 20 years ago here. And when that style is what they embrace from the beginning, I think it goes a long way. But I think the same thing can be said kind of mentally, right? Like if if they hit some hiccups or if they have a weird first quarter or if somebody gets into foul trouble or they run into a rut where they do have a, a few of those live ball turnovers in a row, it's really hard for them to flip that switch back on once it gets flipped off. So I really, to me, like the best way I can put it is rhythm. And to put that into a positive tonight, obviously, as I said at the beginning, KD and Book come out. They take a, a bunch of threes early, which is important. The ball is moving. The ball is popping. I think you're absolutely right that they they didn't just settle into. All right, these are our guys. They're gonna. We're just gonna feed them all night. Like Grayson had a couple nice moments. Beal had some. Nurkic had more as the game went on. Offensive rebounding was big. Everything else, and that rhythm kind of kind of comes. So in this case, they did fight back against a little bit of a run. They never really got pushed to where they had to flip it back to on, but maybe that's the key is just come out swinging every night, come out focused every night, and yeah, you're not going to be perfect, but at least you give yourself a cushion. That's the best I can kind of come up with because it's it's hard to analyze all of it, like you said. It, it's, it's, it, it's confusing. It's mind-boggling. Yep, and, and uh, we were talking before even recording earlier, and you're just saying, you know, these everyone likes to focus on on the losses and like the doomsday approach but at the same time like these games do count also and i feel like that was a great point in terms of just like i feel like sometimes we almost discount uh these types of wins and like the denver win and look i'm not saying like jump completely back on the ship and say like the suns are back because i'm not doing that by any means but no. i think it shows i won't do team. it actually i'll promise you right now that will not be happening for the rest of the regular season guys so uh, i don't know about brandon i don't speak for you but mm. i'm not doing an overreaction in either direction the rest of the year because it doesn't look, i have no way to do it how am i supposed to look if, if they went out then then uh you know i'll i'll, I'll be back okay yeah but, uh, that's that's, that's about it I'm, I'm with you though i think it's it's uh right you can't put too, like too much in this and that's why i say like I feel like they play up and down to their competition and, and sometimes the games just don't make sense. And uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the playoffs. Uh, you could probably argue it'd be good considering they're going to be playing a good team and a big stage, but at the same time, you don't want to develop bad habits. And I feel like they've done that uh, over the course of the year and the in inconsistency is definitely alarming, but at the same time, these, these peaks show you how dangerous they can be. So um, I still just kind of walk in that plank of, I don't know what to make of this team, but I, one thing I will say is when they are on, you don't want to play them and be on the other side of that because they are, they could be anyone. I mean, I've kind of tried to also at, at the same time with this team because it, it is, I almost feel like they've evolved to the point where it's worse to watch them every day and actually go through each of the crazy ups and the, and the crazy downs, just in terms of really trying to get a gauge on what they're capable of in the postseason. And that's why I did the show I did on Monday where I basically was just like, let's zoom out to 30,000 feet and look at what the stakes are, what the expectation should be, everything else. Because I'm like, granular level, I'm lost. 
But other people who don't watch every day, I've been trying to pay attention to what they think. And somebody like Steve Jones Jr., who's on the Dunker Spot and does some stuff on JJ Reddick's podcast and whatnot, has been retweeting himself a bunch lately about this team where he basically has this thing from a few weeks ago where it just says, I still don't want to face them in the first round if I'm anybody else. And I think that's kind of, that's where a lot of national media or other teams fans seem to be. Like, I actually think Suns fans are now lower on the Suns than non-Suns fans. I'm not saying that's wrong. Again, I'm not going to tell you anything that you've analyzed about this team is, is right or wrong at this point. I guess I'm just pointing it out. And it speaks to, right, that ceiling is still there, even though it might feel like it's not. They've had pretty big, impressive wins against several teams. Now, not the Oklahoma City Thunder. So, you know, <laughs> you're well within your rights to freak out about that matchup and be doomsday about that. But everything else, it's like, yeah, I mean, if you told me that they were in a close game seven against the Nuggets a month from now, I wouldn't really push back that much. It could, I could easily see it, you know? So it's uh, it's it's definitely weird. But yeah, rhythm would be my best guess. I don't have, I don't have much more uh, deep analysis than that. But I think when they're in a mental and a physical rhythm, that's when they're really playing at their best. And I think that honestly emanates from how Katie and Book play, right? I mean, those are both rhythm players at, at the end of the day. Yeah, a lot of those are intertwined too. Like the effort usually comes hand in hand with rhythm, I feel like. Uh, most of the time, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. But I think usually when they're locked in, it's just across the board. You could just notice that difference. And there's not any – but the weird part, like we've said, is there's not any one specific stat or one thing that happens no. all the time. It's just kind of pick your poison. Rhythm is it's, not in the box score. Exactly. So it's uh, – like I think you put it pretty – perfect though that Suns fans are probably lower on them than national media at this point just because of how close and how well we know them it's it's like uh I I just I, I can't put it in words and I think at, at this point we just got to just get in the playoffs healthy and that's that's the main yeah. key for me is like just get there healthy and just f- figure that's it where out I'm at. like I'm, I'm just that's not where I'm at I'll, I'll talk season. about each game. I'm going to tell you what went right, what went wrong, what my take on it is, but I am done with the bold proclamations in any one direction. Outside of yesterday where I was like, yeah, everybody could get fired and traded. I'll tell you that. But other than that, I, I don't know about what the results are going to be between now and then or if that outcome's even going to actually bear fruit or if we're just going to get something way better and not expect it either. But all right, let's get to what the box score does show us, starting with threes and free throws, and we'll break down some of how that Went the sun's way coming up in just one moment. First, a quick word from our old friends at Game Time, the best place to buy any ticket you need. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. So if you want to catch the reigning NL champion Arizona Diamondbacks, or if you're traveling, maybe, and you want to catch, I love to do that when I'm out of town during the summer, just see if the baseball team's in town. Game time's the best place to do that. Killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and a last, a lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying all tickets, as well as Major League Baseball. Here's what I love the most about game time, personally, seat views. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. And this is the the real deal. I usually, you know, before game time existed, I'd be buying my ticket one place. There were all these weird, sketchy websites where people would upload their own picture. And you're like, is this even real? Why is this person's camera suck? What is going on here? Instead, game time has it right there. So you see the row, you see the number, you see the section, and you see a picture of what you are going to be looking at when you're sitting there. So if you are out of town, you've never been to the place you're going to be buying a ticket for. It's really awesome. But even if you know, you've been there before. You might not have sat in that exact place. You want to make sure you're not behind a bar or you're not looking over a crowd or in a weird section where there's going to be drunk people or whatever. Game Time does that for you. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account, redeem the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Again, Game Time app. Download it now. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, Brandon. Let's close it out. So. Let's start with the box score oddity. I also want to get to a a NERC report tonight. I think his performance was worth focusing in on. But we talked about the threes plenty. Just to highlight it, though, they took 20 more threes than the Pelicans. So that is a really tough deficit to overcome. 
no matter what team you are. New Orleans had a pretty solid offensive night. I mean, they shot 47%. They had a bunch of guys in double figures. Their turnovers were pretty low. They had some offensive rebounds. But if you're going to take 20 fewer threes than your opponent, you're probably going to lose. So that's that's the value right there. And then free throws is where I wanted to toss it back to you. Because one of the things the Suns have been really good at all season, one of the categories they've owned that's been a big improvement from previous seasons is is free throw rate. They get to the line as well as anybody in the NBA. They've been first or second in that category all year. But everybody's been dealing with a lower free throw total around the league. That's obviously been a big talking point. How do you expect that to look in the playoffs? Do you feel like the Suns will be able to count on that? Do you think they've proven, hey, we're number one in this category all season? Or do you think it might sway the other direction or be unpredictable given those rule changes, given, you know, Book doesn't always get the calls that he might like to get? Where are you at with their ability to really slow games down and win that category come playoff time? Look, I, I hate to go this route, but when it comes to uh, th- those pinstripes, uh, those refs, the zebras, I just I cannot trust any consistency, especially come playoff time, because they really do change how they officiate. So um, while I do think it is encouraging that they've they've improved a lot and they have more downhill threats with uh, Bradley Beal, Grayson Allen even can get downhill. I think Booker and Durant, uh, their their gravity really opens up a lot for for those two to attack the rim uh, a little bit more as well. And Nurkic is just a problem when he catches it on the block um, in some favorable situations based off that gravity created. So I think they have the weapons and the tools to to have big free throw games. But is it something I'm going to count on or bank on? Like they're going to have a clear advantage over, you know, let's say they're in the play in game against the Lakers or Warriors. Like, good luck. I just don't. I just especially I'm the first one you said there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The 100 percent. So to me, it's like, yes, I think. It's something that you could label as a strength potentially, but it's not something I, I think that's going to uh, really matter because each game is so different come playoff time. And it's just more of a, a matchup dependent basis, really. So uh, yeah. encouraging. I don't want to like, you know, rain on the parade because I do think it is something worth noting, but not something that I will ever as a Suns fan bank on. Completely fair. So last year in the postseason, they were seventh in fa- in free throw rate. Um, some of that is including the Pelicans and the and the Thunder, who just played in play-in games. So I'll eliminate that, and we'll say they were fifth. But they were behind the Clippers, the Knicks, the Lakers, and the Wolves. They were a touch ahead of Denver. And if you look in that second round, they were in the game three that they won. They had twenty uh, eighteen free throw attempts compared to. 21 for the Nuggets and in the game four win that they had they were at 29 attempts compared to 23 for the Nuggets a lot of that coming from Duran who had 13 so I would say it will be part of what they count on but you know I think any team that relies on that too much we always kind of poke a hole in that come playoff time so we'll have to see reason I brought it up 20 of 25 from the line tonight they made more than the Pelicans New Orleans did attempt a similar amount. So a high free throw game in a, in a league that hasn't had a lot of those lately. But that brings us to Yusuf Nurkic, who was a big driver of that. And it is time for the Nurk Report, where we just talk about all the crazy things that Yusuf Nurkic does in every game, Brandon. And first of all, not a rhythm play early on was him botching like three layups in a row. But rallies after that 19 and 19 another huge rebounding game four assists just one turnover five fouls but 36 minutes is also very impressive and that's kind of where I wanted to go again kind of looking toward playoff time and stuff the fact that he was able to stay on the court have an impact and really I think illustrate for for Suns fans why he is significantly more valuable than a guy like Valanchunas who you might like if you were just being lazy compared to him to right I think Nurkic continues to prove that there could be teams that go small. There could be teams that have another big physical center. There could be teams where he has to, you know, guard a, a, a floor spacer. He's going to be able to handle it, and he's he's good for a, a pretty solid impact, even if his minutes will fluctuate. So shout out to Nurkic on a night where he did a lot. Yeah, I mean, he had eight offensive rebounds. That was huge. I thought they out rebounded them by twelve and. That's something uh, against a team as big as New Orleans, like you, you'll take that any day. So I think uh, just his ability to create those extra possessions and, and just really battle down low really can help 
shift the momentum of a game. And you'll see when those Suns when the Suns have those possessions where they get two or three shots and really make the defense work. Uh, I think that's that's when they're at their best. Even though I obviously want to make the first shot, but like I think anytime you can create those extra opportunities, it's, it's just deflating for the defense. Uh, makes them work harder. And, and I think the Suns. Uh, anytime they have a 10 plus board advantage, like uh, it's just, it's, it's going to be tough to lose those games unless you're just turning it over like we've seen them do in the past. So I think the fact that they were, you know, did a decent job of taking care of the ball too. And I think they had like 12 to, to zero assisted turnover ratio in the first quarter that just kind of set the tone of taking care of the ball early. And and then the fact that, you know, Nurkic bounced back from that, uh, like I said, that the early struggles and still had a, a massive game was, was awesome. I was glad Eddie Johnson at least pointed that out. I mean, mm-hmm. love EJ. He is a homer. But it's, it's funny when he gets to a point where it's like, all right, even I have to say something. You know what I mean? I, he was like, yeah. he just said, those are the ones Nurk has to make. It's like, yes, thank you. Exactly. Um, but, okay, so the other part of this is on the defensive end. And I think the thing that teams get caught into, and I get it, if you don't have a lot of size on the backside or, or you're just – kind of thin on options overall. I get the temptation to put your center on Zion, but it it's not going to work well for you. Because one, he's probably, he's too fast. He'll beat that guy, and then there's no help at the rim. And second, he's going to get that guy into foul trouble. It's just use your center as help on the backside, if at all possible, if you have anybody who can realistically defend Zion one-on-one. And obviously, we saw Beal pick that up again. So what did you think of how they guarded Zion tonight. We talked a lot about all the good things on the Sun side. We haven't really focused on the Pelicans part of this at all. And his first half, I think he was three of eight from the field. And that goes a long way. What'd you think of how they corralled yeah. him? Yeah, you, you stole the words words, yeah, words right out of my mouth there. I was just about to say, I thought in the first half, they did a tremendous job containing him. Second half, he just kind of went more in that mode of he's going to, I think EJ said it, force the refs to make him call um with some of his downhill driving and that's just what he does but i think given the sun's personnel like the fact that they could really kind of take him out of the game in that first half was was huge and a a major component as to why they were up by you know 20 points at halftime so i think uh you know anytime there's a downhill threat as athletic and and uh just massive as zion uh being able to stay in front is huge stay in front without fouling is another thing and that overturn call also uh a great indicator that the Suns can disrupt these guys and like we even saw a completely different player stylistically but Jokic the last two times they've played against him too just that as a hub of that offense just really disrupting him digging down forcing some uncharacteristic turnovers like to me that's really encouraging that the Suns defense has that in them um, even if it's for small stretches because you're not going to shut these guys down for the entire game like you're just not so if you can do it for a little bit come playoff time, that might be all you need defensively if your offense is clicking. So they have it in them uh, defensively. I thought tonight they did a good job of using Nurkic uh, pretty smart on that end too, just as that back line, um, line of defense. So hopefully they can keep it rolling and he can play 30 plus minutes, stay out, stay out of foul trouble. And uh, that's, that's the key come playoff time, right? It is. And Another thing that could come up uh, as important heading into the playoffs, the Suns now have the tiebreaker of the Pelicans. They do play them one more time, but they are now winners of two out of three, regardless of what happens in that last one. So if they were to end up tied in the standings with New Orleans, they would get the nudge, uh, nudge, nudge ahead of them. They are seventh after this game one loss behind New Orleans, and everything is still on the table, as I think has been the theme of this show. This team confuses us and everything else, but that's the bottom line. There's no arguing with the standings. They got a big one when they needed it on the road, and they are still within definite territory of getting that six seed. So that will wrap us up. Catch Brandon's writing over at Bright Side of the Sun. You can catch, I promise you guys, a watch back on the Locked on Suns Insiders feed tomorrow looking at the i don't know probably the 
probably the fourth quarter of this game, which ended up being the tightest one. Otherwise, it would just be me going, wow, a bunch of times at, at book. So we'll, we'll do the fourth when there was actual chess moves happening on the court between the two teams. So you have that to look forward to. If you sign up with the link in the show description below or visit jointsubtext.com slash Suns. I'll be back tomorrow getting you ready for Suns Cavs. Until then, enjoy your Wednesday. I'll talk to you soon.